you can introduce it. So next up, next up we've got a paper um, by John Isekowitz and a couple um, of his co-authors whom he will introduce. Uh, John is the former president of the Harvard Sports Analysis Collective here. Um, and uh, actually used to, used to work for the Phoenix Suns, but uh, decided not to keep working for them and instead to go into the world of high finance. So um, uh, you may give that what you will. But he wrote his senior thesis on the presence of availability bias in NBA free agent contracts. And I'll leave it to him to introduce his co-authors. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get official bios, but my two old co-authors are Carolyn Stein and Andrew Boskowski. Both actually graduated with me last year uh, with degrees in economics. And Carolyn was applied math economics, and Andrew had a secondary in CS. So I'll let Carolyn kick it off. Hi, everyone. So we're here to talk about the hot hand. Um, and so just I'm sure everyone knows, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, in the context of basketball, the hot hand is the belief that a player who has made uh, many of his previous several shots is more likely to make his next shot. So it's the idea that shots are not independent events. And in the academic literature, it's at this point pretty much well believed that it's a fallacy. And the sort of the first and the seminal paper on this was the uh, Gilovich, Valone, and Tversky paper, where the authors show that the probability of you making your next shot conditional on having made your previous two, three, four shots or having missed your previous two, three, four shots, is all, it's all about the same. There's not significant differences there. And they also show that the length of the streaks of hits or of misses are typical of what you would expect on, um, in an independent process. And they also show that there's no unexpected streakiness in free throw shooting. And there have been follow-up studies where authors look at, they restrict the sample to shots taken within the same time of each other. Some authors have looked at the uh, NBA long distance shootout competition, and no one has found convincing evidence that the hot hand exists. And it's sort of become a well-accepted fallacy. Um, this past winter, Larry Summers is sort of on the record at poking fun or criticizing the Harvard basketball team for believing in the hot hand. David Brooks uses it as a, one of his, you know, prime example of the big data revolution. One of the great things it's done is dispel myths like the hot hand. And yet it's sort of the myth that refuses to die. Um, and so in this paper, we question, is it really a fallacy? Because if you actually read the original Gilovich, Valone, and Tversky paper, their results hinge on this very critical assumption, which I'm actually just going to read word for word out of their paper here. It may seem unreasonable, the authors write, to compare basketball shooting to coin tossing because a player's chances of hitting a basket are not the same on every shot. Layups are easier than three-point field goals, and slam dunks have a higher hit rate than turnaround jumpers. Nevertheless, the simple binomial model is equivalent to a more complicated process with the following characteristics. Each player has an ensemble of shots that vary in difficulty, depending, for example, on the distance from the basket or on defensive pressure, and each shot is randomly selected from this ensemble. So this randomly selected part is what we take issue with. Because here's the thing, if players believe in the hot hand, their perception of heat may affect the difficulty of shots they select. So if hot players are more likely to select difficult shots, this could offset the effect of heat. So our approach is sort of we try to answer two questions. One, do players attempt more difficult shots as they become hotter? And two, are players more likely to make their next shot if we control for the difficulty of this shot? So I won't spend too much time on the data because it seems like a lot of people are using the uh, similar data sets, but the, the, the optical data that's now available is particularly interesting to the hot hand debate because um, we just have such a richer data set than previous literature has been had access to or been able to, to analyze. Um, so we, we took our data from the NBA as well as the sports view optical tracking data. Um, the NBA's first data set that we used was the roster data set where we pulled player specific characteristics, be it uh, height and weight and, and other characteristics individual to the particular player. Um, the expanded play-by-play -play from the NBA is more or less a, a list of events of, uh, that went on during the game, be it a, uh, a rebound, a shot, uh, a foul, and give you some metadata associated with what happened during that particular event 
Um, so as said before, the, the optical tracking data is taken at a 1 25th of a second increments and gives you kind of insight on where are all the players, where's the ball, um, some of those amazing an animations from before kind of outlined it very well. And then lastly, the play-by-play -play optical data kind of uh, marries the two data sets of um, expanded play-by-play -play is where, what's going on as well as where in the optical data set uh, you can s see the various observations. Um, so here's some like kind of general numbers about our data. Uh, there were 83,000 shots in our data set um, and our estimations were a little different but we have about 600 million uh, optical, data, uh, optical observations. Uh, so yeah, those are about uh, half the arenas. Uh, so we had half, uh, half the games but we were able to have shots from every player uh, in the NBA. So in order to kind of uh, make this data useful to us, we compiled a shot log, which more or less gave us a snapshot of what was going on at every uh, shot attempt, where we took in information as far as shot condition, um, where the shot was taken, um, what kind of shot it was, how it was categorized, uh, among other various um, characteristics of the shot. We also took in game condition being uh, how, where in the game it was, how much time is remaining, um, as well as the score differential at the time the shot was taken. Uh, and then lastly, we also took into account defensive conditions being um, where are all the players relative to the shooter as well as uh, the relative angle of the defensive uh, player to the basket. Um, so overall, we pretty much were able to take a snapshot of every shot attempt taken, or half the shot attempts taken in the last season for the NBA. Okay, so before we sort of get into the full analysis, we just want to run through some of like the empirical uh, preliminaries and strategies that we use. So the first thing is that we talk about controlling for shot difficulty. Um, so what does that mean? How do we measure shot difficulty? So what we ended up doing was we came up with a model that predicts the likelihood that a given shot goes in, giving all the characteristics we know when that shot is taken. Um, and this works because if you know the prob if you know a shot has a, you know, an 80% probability of going in, that's an easy shot versus if it has a 10%, that's, that's a more difficult shot. Um, so just you know, on a basic level, it's, basic, it's just a regression um, where we use game condition controls. So these include things like what quarter are we in, how much time is on the clock, what's the score differential. Then there's shot controls. So this includes where the shot is taken from and we actually grid the court up into one foot by one foot boxes. And so we know like pretty much the precise location the shot is taken from. And we also know what type of shot it was. We have 13 mutually exclusive shot categories. Like these include things like jump shot, layup, turnaround jumper. Um, and then we have defensive controls that measure the defensive intensity. So these are how far away is the closest defender what angle is that closest defender relative to the shooter? So are they right in the line of the shot or are they off to the side? Um, we have the, whether or not the player is being double covered. We also have the height differential between the two players sort of to see if there's a mismatch going on. And then we have player fixed effects to encapsulate the fact that different players are just different, uh, different shooting abilities. So the nice thing is that you take all these different controls and you collapse them into this one measure of how likely the shot is to go in and that encapsulates the difficulty of that shot. So how good is this model? That was, you know, that's an important consideration. So one thing we did was we just randomly split the data in half and ran the model on half of the data to come up with coefficients. And then we apply this model to the second half of the data. And on the x-axis, we have the predicted probability of these shots. And on the y-axis, we have the actual make percentage. So if the model is perfect, this would fall exactly in a 45 degree line. And you see the data, it, it almost does. So we feel pretty good about this model as an accurate predictor of how difficult the shots are. The second thing we need to figure out is how are we going to measure heat? Because we talk about, you know, players being hot, but what does that mean? So there's sort of, we come up with two measures. One is what we call simple heat. So simple heat sub n would just simply measure a player's shooting percentage over his past n shots. So if you've gone three for four, your simple heat sub four would just be 0.75. And then we talk about complex heat, which is a little bit more subtle. But what it does is it measures the difference between a player's actual shooting percentage over his past end shots versus his expected shooting percentage, where we calculate the expected shooting percentage using these p-hat values. So let's take the same example, but this time we actually know what the difficulties of those past four shots were. So it's complex heat sub four would be 0.75, the actual shooting percentage. But in this example, when we know the p-hat values, we know that he was expected to have a 0.5 shooting percentage over those past four shots. 
So that leaves us with a complex heat value of 0.25. So here, anything that's substantially larger than zero represents a player who's hot in the sense that he is outperforming given how difficult those shots were. So complex heat might be less intuitive on the surface, but we argue that it's a better measure because it measures true overperformance. It gives more credit to the player who's gone two for three from behind the three-point line than the guy who's gone two for three on layups. The other thing it does is it controls for serial correlation between shots. So I think this is best explained with an example. Imagine that over the course of a game, a tall player is covered by a player who's too short. It's a mismatch. Um, so he is going to have, he's going to have probably pretty high simple heat because he's going to be taking shots that are relatively easier. But his next shot, he's still going to be covered by this player who's slightly shorter. So his next shot, the P hat value is also going to be higher. So you observe this sort of, there's this mechanical correlation between simple heat and P hat. And this mechanical correlation is going to bias our results. But when you use complex heat, you control for the difficulty of these past prior shots because you, can, you decompose it into simple heat and then the expected prior shooting percentage. That includes these sort of, uh, these events that last over multiple shots. So you get rid of this mechanical correlation which is gonna lead to better results. All right, so now that we've gone through some of the empirical preliminaries and our, our empirical strategy, we can get to the results. So the first question that we sought to answer is do players believe in the hot hand? Do they significantly vary their shot uh, choices based on if they believe that they're hot or not? So we, an we tried to answer four different questions. And these have been answered in sort of a uh, piecemeal way in previous papers, so this is confirming some existing work. So do players that are, believe that they are hot take shots from further away? Do defenders cover hot players more closely? Are hot players more likely to take their team's next shot? And then are those shots more difficult? So briefly, what we wanted to do is use both simple and complex heat in different regression models, and then include a set of controls that varied for which question we were asking. So obviously, we're not going to include shot distance or shot type when we're evaluating shot distance. And then in every case, we're going to include player fixed effects to try to control for innate differences in players' ability. So what, what's the answer? The answer is a resounding yes. Players do believe and alter their, their uh, strategies based on if they believe they're hot or not. Uh, and if you look at the coefficients uh, for simple heat and complex heat, they're almost identical. So it really is not a case of us just picking and choosing a measure of heat that confirms our, our results. Uh, I think it's really important to talk about effect sizes because throwing a lot of stars up there to say it's significant at the 1% level or whatever doesn't necessarily have a real world impact. So when we think about effect sizes, we think about, in this case, making one additional shot of your last four. If you see we have simple heat four and complex heat four is meaning looking at your last four shots. Making one additional shot of your last four and holding everything else constant. And what does that do? So that's what that table at the bottom is showing you. If you look at shot distance, the raw effect size is we would expect your shot distance to increase by about seven inches, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you consider that the average shot is taken from about 12 and a half feet away, that's actually like a 5% increase in your shot distance if you have made an additional shot in your last four. I actually think the most important result on this page is the probability that you take your team's next shot. Uh, we found about a 1.4 percentage point increase in the likelihood of taking your team's next shot if you've made an additional shot in your last four. But when you think about roughly the average usage rate for an NBA player, and obviously it varies by player, is roughly 20%, that's more like a 7% increase, which is a significant difference. And I think these two graphs sort of show an example with a couple individual players how this plays out. And you know, J.R. Smith, uh, is a guy who is clearly very confident in his own abilities. When he has made f four of his last five shots, he's taking the next shot on his team over 50% of the time. So clearly there are players who are altering whether they take the next shot based on how they have done in the past. And obviously that could be exploiting different defensive matchups and it might not all be down to, oh, they're taking worse shots. But one of the cornerstones of basketball analytics is the trade-off on one hand between efficiency and usage. And it's likely that in most cases, the marginal shot that you are adding to yourself as a player is likely gonna be more difficult than your average shot. 
So if you believe that you're hot and players believe that they're hot and they take significantly more shots than they otherwise would take, that marginal shot is likely going to be more difficult. And if you don't control for that difficulty, you're going to mask any hot hand effect that might actually be present. So now moving on to sort of the main event, taking all of this information and using it to test for the hot hand. So we did this in two main ways. The first way is we ran the specification that's very similar to what everybody else has run in the past 25 years of hot hand research. We took the, the simple heat for your last one through five shots, and then we used a player fixed effect and we didn't control it all for difficulty. And when we ran this, we confirmed the results that everybody else had seen. The coefficient on simple heat was consistently zero or even slightly negative. But as we've argued, what you really need to do is control for the difficulty. You need to control for the difficulty of the present shot that you're taking and the difficulty of the past shots through our complex heat metric. So a slight diversion, uh, just going off of what Carolyn mentioned earlier, the problems with simple heat, the problems with serial correlation across stretches in the game. If you look at these two regressions, the coefficient on simple heat one, which is just whether or not you made your last shot, controlling for the difficulty of your current shot is not statistically significant. But when you go back to simple heat three, looking at your shooting percentage over your last three shots, suddenly the coefficient gets much larger, is negative, and is significant at the 1% level. So what's going on here? We argue that it is the bias of simple heat being autocorrelated with, fit, with the, uh, prediction, the, the predicted probability of your current shot. We argue that this is the evidence that simple heat is not the right way to think about it because of that mechanical correlation. So what happens when we control for the difficulty of your past and, and present shots? Well, here we show results for complex heat over your past three, four, and five shots. And as you can see, the coefficients are statistically significant and they're positive. Again, I think it's important to talk about effect size. One thing that's interesting is we ran these specifications for complex heat over your past one all the way out to six shots. And the effects were always significant, but the effect size was diminished as you moved further out. And one thing that's interesting is if you look at the actual game time elapsed between an average player's sixth prior shot and his current shot, it's about 15 minutes of game time. And so clearly nobody is going to say that a player is hot based on what they did a quarter and a half ago. So it's a, I think it confirms and it, it's, a, it's comforting for us that the effect size diminishes as you move further and further away and use more shots. So the effect size here isn't super large using the conventions that everybody else uses in academia. If you increase your complex heat by making one more of your last four shots, then that uh, uh, basically leads to a 0.8 percentage point increase in the likelihood of making your current shot. Given that we, our P hat model found for the 83,000 shots we looked at, the average difficulty was about 45, 46%. That's a 1.5% increase in your expected performance by increasing your heat by one shot. But when people think of the hot hand, they're not thinking in one shot increments. They're not thinking about a guy who goes from making one out of his last four to two out of his last four. They're thinking about a guy who goes from making one out of his last four to three or four out of his last four. So if you look at it sort of increasing your heat by two, then suddenly the percentage increase is more like 4%, which again is probably not as large as the general public believes the hot hand to be, but is still significant in a real world sense. So just to conclude and sort of place our research in the larger context, what have we found using this new data set of optical tracking data using over half the, half the shots taken over the course of an NBA season? Well, I think we found that players significantly change their behavior based on their perceived hotness as measured by their, their performance over their last couple of shots. They're shooting from further away, they're shooting with defenders closer to them, and they're more likely to take the team's next shot. And that all translates to more difficult shots. I think the main takeaway from our complex heat regressions is that given, if you look at players who are outperforming their expectations, given what they've done recently, they are going to continue to outperform. Now that outperformance may be relatively small compared to what the general public thinks, but we think it is significant and it's greater than zero, whereas most of the literature which hasn't done that control believes that it's negative or zero. Uh, I know that we have a lot of basketball stats guys in our audience, and clearly our paper is not quite as applicable directly as Dan's uh, to, 
decision making. But I would say that I think our p-hat model is a pretty good way to measure uh, a player's shooting percentage and also a, a way to measure defensive performance. Uh, and it's going to be much more nuanced than field goal percentage. And I actually think it's more of an extension of the work that Kurt Goldsberry has done with the shooting charts. Using p-hat, you can see where a player is outperforming expectations on every spot on the floor with every type of defensive coverage, with every type of shot. I just want to conclude quickly with a quote from Amos Tversky, who you know is one of the fathers of behavioral uh, economics and the author of the original paper. He said in 2006, I've had a thousand arguments about the hot hand, I've won all of them, and I've convinced no one. <laughs> well, I think that it's actually instructive here because, you know, unfortunately, Ms. Dr. Professor Tversky is no longer with us, but had he had this data, he might have reached a different conclusion. And so it's important when you talk to guys in the NBA, the players and coaches who live and breathe this game for 20 years, and you're coming from an analytical perspective and you have some results or some results in the past that don't necessarily jibe with the way that they see the game, just remember, there's always more data to get and more analyses to run, and it might be that the conflict between your view and their view is not as great as, you may, as it may initially seem. Thank you. We've got time for one question. If, is, there a, is there one question? If there's not, that makes it easy. Thank you, John. Yeah.